uh, I'm just going to assume that you already know the idea of a standard candle, which is essential. It's the foundation of observational cosmology. But just to remind you, what are most of the stars in the universe? Why is it that 90% or more of the stars that you see, uh, we happen to catch them in their main sequence lifetime? Because 90% of their lives are spent burning hydrogen into helium in the core. It is a very gradual, long-lived process compared to all the other processes, like when they go through a red giant phase, or maybe a super giant phase, uh, which happen very fast. The beauty of this is that they're all basically the same. They have the same physics, the same kind of equation of state, the same equations of energy generation. Main sequence, of course, the relation between the surface temperature that you observe quite easily of the star and then intrinsic luminosity of the star, maybe compared to the sun, is fixed. It's set. Every main sequence star, which is most stars you're going to see, as long as you were confident that they're on the main sequence, is as long as you know the surface temperature, basically just tell me what the color of the star is, it's a standard candle. The whole main sequence is like a bunch of standard candles. This is just an example. Seven sisters there, there's actually more of them. It's a star cluster that recently was born, the Pleiades. This includes some very massive stars, which are in the upper main sequence which have formed recently, but they're still in their main sequence phases. And you can compare that, for example, to another star cluster that has its own main sequence, the Hyades star cluster. And literally, if you compare stars of the same surface temperature, then they must have the same intrinsic luminosity. And the only difference would be because of the distance. By and large, this, these main sequence stars don't change their brightness, their intrinsic luminosity too much, so it's a pretty good standard candle. So star clusters, we ought to, because we can see a main sequence in them, ought to be great. Why do I care so much about star clusters, globular clusters, I'm thinking of in particular? It's a crucial step that we must take in order to solve cosmology, because star clusters, hint, have 100,000 stars in them, maybe hint, that means they're going to have a few unusual stars. I mean, stars that might be passing through an unusual brief phase of their evolutionary lifetime. I could find them in a star cluster and know how far away they are and how luminous they are, because everything in a star cluster is the same distance from us. During the post- red giant evolution, after the first red giant phase, somewhat more intermediate mass stars go through a phase where they have a fairly high surface temperature, they're burning helium in their core, and because of the instability of when hydrogen ionizes or when it becomes neutral, and things we're not totally at all getting into about stellar atmospheres, these very bright stars during that phase are in the so-called instability strip where they will just naturally pulsate. They're naturally variable and you can't stop them and it's periodic. Here's actual observational data of a rather distant, in another galaxy, Cepheid variable star. Now you realize they're just named, like many things in astronomy, it's named after the first one that was found. Delta Cepheus, the fourth brightest star in the constellation. Cepheus is the prototype Cepheid variable. Now they're all called that. It used to be called Delta Cepheid variables, whatever. Polaris is one you can actually see with your naked eye there. And it's a variable, um, fairly small amplitude. They have this very characteristic sawtooth brightening and then a sort of a gradual fading. These uh, observational periods range from it might be as short as a few days, it might be up to several months. So, the, But they have a well-defined period. If you're patient and you'll go back and look at these things every few days for a number of months, they leap out at you. You can't miss these things because they're variable. Everything else in, the, in your photographic plate of your star cluster shouldn't change. But these variables will catch your attention, especially because look how bright they are. I love these stars. Thousands of times brighter than the luminosity of the sun. So we ought to be able to see these at much larger distances than main sequence stars like the sun. Maybe 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun. Oh my gosh, we could detect and study and measure the periods of Cepheid variable stars in other galaxies beyond the Milky Way. Now you see why I'm so into star clusters, the homes 
of Cepheid variable stars. That's all. I, and the homes of main sequence distances. That's the only reason I really care about them. Actually, star clusters are interesting for one other reason. The globular star clusters are the homes of the oldest known stars, the first ones to be born in the universe. So they also tell us approximately the age universe. It's not just good enough to measure the brightness of the Cepheid variable star, because like I said, there's big ones that are very luminous. There's little ones that are less luminous. They're not in themselves a standard candle, unless you use the fact that the measured period on the horizontal axis here, I think this is in days, like there's 10 days here, Here's a month, 30 days. Bigger the star is, the more luminous the star is, the longer it, these are actual physical oscillations. It's actually ringing like a bell. Correlation or the ability to predict, this is an absolute magnitude. Ooh, I like that, minus six, very luminous. Wow, so much more luminous than the sun. Absolute magnitude, 4.8. If I can find some Cepheid variable stars and measure the periods, I know their intrinsic luminosity. They are, for me, a standard candle. I've just determined the distance of whatever object contains the Cepheid variable star. They took lots of pictures of the two nearest companion galaxies. Beautiful picture of them here. There's a small cloud of Magellan. There's a large Magellanic cloud. We're just lucky that there are these two galaxies, only in the Southern Hemisphere, that are big enough uh, to have Cepheid variable stars in them, and we're lucky that Henrietta Swan Leavitt got this huge pile of plates taken in Chile, delivered to her up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she started looking through them. I don't even really know what the plan was, but they started looking through all these plates. She found the variables. She realized that they were a particular class of variables. She made the light curve. She measured the periods. And since they were all at the same distance, we now know quite accurately, it's about 150,000 light years. So then she knew their period luminosity law, she had created the first and still the most essential standard candles in all of astronomy. You give astronomers a plan and then you give them a telescope that has enough magnifying power, has to be above the distortions of the Earth's atmosphere, to resolve individual bright stars in the outer parts of galaxies, they are going to go crazy. Why do you think they called it the Hubble telescope in the first place? He was, he's not even like really the 50 most important or famous astronomers, but the Hubble Space Telescope 10 years before launch was sold as it's going to resolve Cepheid variable stars in nearby galaxies and give us distances to all nearby galaxies, which will then be used to establish the distance scale of the universe. Here's some discovery photographs. Not very impressive, is it? They spend an enormous amount of Hubble Space Telescope time to, to tell us accurate distances to two dozen uh, galaxy. What you're doing is giving me a step-by-step -step process. The way that we know the distances of main sequence stars is through the parallax method, which is based on knowing the size of the astronomical unit, right? We make these long skinny triangles, but that only works for stars that are within a few hundred light years of us. So that's how we know the absolute magnitudes of the main sequence. Then, but of course, you can't do parallax on other galaxies. Forget it. So you have to do steps you do a step that really is accurate to get nearby distances, and then you use those nearby distances to do something that's brighter and further away. Then you get the distances to nearby galaxies, and then we're gonna use the nearby galaxies to give us another step that takes us to the distances of far away galaxies. It's a step-by-step, -step. it's like climbing a ladder. And I hate to tell you, each of the steps, his first steps are pretty solid. Parallax, yeah, I know what an astronomical unit is, no problem there. But you get to the higher steps, to the more distances in the ladder, and these rungs get to be a little bit uh, shakier, sorry to say. Now, we have a bunch of galaxies that are calibrators. We know the distances of these lucky Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, two dozen galaxies quite accurately. The galaxies were partly chosen because some of them had known special kinds of supernovae historically had been measured in them, type 1a supernova. Do you all remember the Tully-Fisher relationship from its back? You know how to correct for the inclination viewing angle of the, of the spiral disk. You measure accurately the rotation velocity of the gas. That is a tight, close predictor correlated with the 
total luminosity of the stars in the galaxy. We just need Tully Fisher calibrator. We've got two ways to go here. You see, we're just about ready to reach up to the far rung at large distances here, not just nearby galaxies. All I need, it could be a faraway galaxy, all I need, <laughs> this might be a matter of luck, is a faraway galaxy that has a type 1a supernova go off in it that we measure its light curve and measure its brightness as a function of time. And we recognize through spectroscopy that that really is a type 1a supernova. Remember, brief reminder, the type 1 supernovas are caused by a white dwarf being pushed over the Chandrasekhar limit and imploding, and that only happens by what? What would make a white dwarf get too heavy to support itself? Accretion from a binary partner. Exactly. So a fairly special circumstance, a close binary where the second less massive star has then gone into its red giant phase, starts dumping matter onto the white dwarf, and the white dwarf started out being close to its uh, Chandrasekhar limit mass anyway, so that it doesn't just make a series of nova explosions like a normal accreting white dwarf. But this one pushes it all. That's uh, You pushed me too far. I'm imploding now. I am not tolerating this. We cannot go above 1.4 solar masses. 1.4 solar masses is pretty much the universal mass of the Chandrasekhar limit. That is the maximum mass at which an electron degenerate star will collapse. Kind of standardized. Maybe the peak brightness of this implosion event, maybe that's a standard candle because it reaches a standard luminosity. I'm gonna just put that on the table there. How long do you have to wait for a galaxy to have a supernova? How long have we been waiting for the Milky Way? We've been waiting centuries here for a supernova in the Milky Way. So most galaxies, we're not gonna be lucky. But we could measure the rotation velocity of that galaxy, that's an easy measurement, and then locate it on the Tully-Fisher relation. And so that's what was done. The classic diagram, the Hubble relation. All right, if this relation had already been made you with less good data, but the straight line relation, V equals HD. The further away a galaxy is, the faster its quote Doppler shift or recession velocity is from us. The slope of the line being H, and that's what they were trying to measure. What's the slope of the line? That requires having very accurate distance. A slope of about 72 kilometers per second for every additional megaparsec of distance away from Earth. What about these supernova 1As? I mean, if you're patient here, in principle, how would you do this? You got to change your whole observing strategy. We're not going to pick the particular galaxies that you wanted to know the distances to. Instead, we're going to pick the galaxies that have a type 1A supernova. How would we do that? Well, I don't know when they're going to happen. So I have to basically take pretty good pictures of millions or at least thousands of galaxies every night and look for the one that has a new apparent star in it, a supernova going off. And then I'm gonna to have to do follow-up measurements to see if it's a type 1a supernova, get the whole light curve and see what the peak brightness is. And then it gets back to my original. So now I have a supernova selected bunch of galaxies. I, they probably hadn't even heard of these galaxies. They're not famous galaxies. They just had the random accident that when we were looking in some areas, they gave us a supernova. We were watching them all the time. But now your big question that I've been dancing around here. Okay, Matt, are these standard candles? Uh, is the peak brightness of all, you limited it to 1A supernova. So it's your, it's your white dwarf being driven over the Chandrasekhar limit. Are they all the same intrinsic luminosity? No. I'm sorry, they're not. Some of them are bigger explosions and some of them are literal explosions. Okay, here's a bunch of light curves of type 1a supernovas. You better catch them at the peak because if you've missed that, <laughs> you don't know how bright they were. Oh no, the peak is sometimes, wow, almost up to, whoa, more than the luminosity of all the stars in the Milky Way. Darn, those are powerful. And then sometimes it's like a factor of 10 less. It's, it's less than the, it's a comparable to, but less than the luminosity of the entire Milky Way of stars. See the distance difference here? Bummer. So it's not a standard candle, but wait. Stumbled on this correlation that I hope y'all can see. At the very intrinsically luminous, the red dot, supernovas here, which reach a high peak luminosity, stay bright longer. The intrinsically less luminous 1A supernovas that don't get up that bright fade rapidly. You got it. If you could measure the decay time, 
the speed at which the light curve fades. You need to get all these points, you know, and watch these things for several weeks after you found them. There's one universal shape of supernova 1A light curve shown on the right panel. This has been stretched or expanded by a time scale which is only a function of the luminosity of the object. A little bit like the Cepheids. You couldn't use those, it's, it's very similar. Isn't it? You couldn't use the Cepheid as a known object of a standard candle luminosity, but if you knew something about the time behavior of it, then bing, you knew what the intrinsic luminosity was. Same, luminosity was. Same thing with the supernova light curves. If you know the decay time accurately, would help, then you could tell the intrinsic luminosity. So now we know the distances to lots and lots of galaxies. When we, uh, Hubble knew them too, it's just his distance scale was horrible. It was, you know, based on guesses, it was systematically completely wrong. And it only, his, his original published figure only had about 10 galaxies on it. He wasn't trying to confirm anything for or he had a hard time believing what people later came along and said. This is like your most important discovery. Really, even at the end of his life, I don't think he was sure. What I found is an empirical linear correlation between the Doppler shift that I measure, there are always red shifts of these galaxies, and how far away I think it is. And later people measured the slope of that thing. What is the meaning? of this Hubble law. What does it actually physically mean? Of course, there's many misconceptions about this. Hopefully, you all already know this. I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Does the fact that essentially all galaxies are receding away from us mean that we are the most unpopular place in the universe? No, it does not. Uh, because a uniform expansion given by Hubble's law here, would be observed by every other galaxy in the universe simultaneously. In other words, as long as you have a homogeneous universe, okay, now this is a bit of a stretch here. I mean, if you look locally, our universe does not have the same density of matter and the same gravitation everywhere. There are clumps, clusters of galaxies, Andromeda, Milky Way, the local group, those are deviations from homogeneity. I'm not talking about those small scales. That's not where the Hubble law applies. That's not where the Hubble law is found. In fact, what's Andromeda's Doppler velocity? Something like minus 150. It's got a blue shift. It's falling in together under our mutual gravitational attraction. The local group is collapsing because it's an overdensity. It's a peculiar velocity. Ignore the peculiar velocities now. For the rest of this course, we're going to forget about the individual uh, uh, anomalous accelerations that particular galaxies have because they happen to live near particular deviations from a homogeneous isotropic universe. On large scales, it appears to be a valid assumption. And it is such an essential assumption that we can't live without it. We can't really do cosmology without it. So I'm going to assume the cosmological principle that on large scales, I mean bigger than the Milky Way, bigger than the local group, bigger than the maybe even the nearest cluster of galaxies like a Virgo cluster, but on larger scales, tens of megaparsecs, the average distribution of matter and mass and galaxies and dark matter in the universe is uniform. It's the same in all directions. Here is a one-dimensional universe, just so we can keep it as simple as possible. It's a rubber band universe where I've marked out some arbitrary locations on a rubber band. Just by arbitrary choice, I happen to put us, which really means the Milky Way, which really means the local group, I happen to put us here, and we'll just call that arbitrary coordinate zero, because that's where we are. Of course, I'm not claiming that we're important in any way. You know, that, that, I'm, I'm, it's a Copernican principle. I'm, I'm, we are in no special uh, can, location here at all. I just called it zero. On my coordinate scheme, the galaxies that are to right here, the nearby one, I'll call it plus one. That'd be a cool name for a galaxy. It'd be easy to keep track of. That's galaxy one over there. This one that's twice as far away is galaxy plus two. The one that's on the opposite direction here, that's named galaxy minus one. Doesn't sound as nice as Andromeda. And this one is galaxy minus two. The universe uniformly expands following a Hubble law. And we let it run for billions of years here. 
and we come back and look at the rubber band. Now, if they're well manufactured, the rubber band is uniform, uniform density. So you put a, a stretch on it, but two ends, each segment of the rubber band increases by the same proportion. It multiplies its length by the same proportion. And if I take a rubber band and stretch it gradually, it might, I wouldn't do this for billions of years. What a boring experiment. I stretch the rubber band to twice its original length. Every single little microscopic section of the rubber is now stretched to twice what it was. It kind of thins out is what it does. So this little segment here, which was maybe one megaparsec, in size has now doubled its size if I waited long enough. So if I'm still keeping us at the center of our coordinate scheme here, this new rubber band here is now where the plus two one is. It's now two megaparsecs away from us. Was it moving? Not really. The space, the stretchy space between us, the empty space, mostly empty between us and that galaxy, which I'm designating with a flag here, itself expanded. The galaxy plus one was going along with the flow. It maybe didn't have hardly any peculiar velocity at all. As far as it's concerned, it's staying stationary. What about the galaxy plus two? It's also going with the flow here. This piece of rubber band doubled in length. This piece of rubber band also doubled in length. And to get to galaxy plus two, there's two pieces of rubber band. So this one doubled in size, and this one also doubled in size. So how far after this expansion is galaxy two? Instead of being two megaparsecs away, it's now four megaparsecs away. It's doubled its distance away from us. And of course, the same thing with galaxy minus one. Galaxy minus one has doubled its distance, so it's now two megaparsecs in the other direction. Where do you think galaxy minus two would be? It doesn't even fit on my diagram here. It would be over here. Whoop, it's off my page. It's, it's over there. It's four megaparsecs away. So if you insist on interpreting this as a Doppler shift, because that's what it looks like to an observer at a telescope with a spectrograph, you would find Hubble's law is obeyed. Galaxy one over this a certain time interval receded by this much distance. That's a, a speed, a certain speed, you know, one per one megaparsec, you know, per billion years or whatever. This galaxy that started out twice as far away is receding twice as fast because it started twice as far away. That's what happens when all distances are uniformly doubled or all distances are uniformly expanded by a factor of, of 10% or whatever. Was it something about our unpopular location? No, not at all. Put yourself in the position of galaxy plus one. What are the uh, astronomers, if there are astronomers, they're probably you know weird blue-green slime balls, uh, highly intelligent astronomers, completely different from us, but they would obey the same thing anyway. They would see the same Hubble lock, so it wouldn't be called Hubble. It'd be called Blikazurzi, because that's the name of their green slime ball astronomer who discovered it on their world. They would have seen, oh, you know, that galaxy over there doesn't really look like the Milky thing. That expanded at a fairly slow speed away from us. We're the center of the expansion. The galaxy in this direction that was also one megaparsec or whatever way, it expanded at this speed. But look, from our point of view, this other galaxy here that we called minus one, it has now moved at twice as far away distance to us. It's receded twice as far away we measure a linear proportionality between the apparent recession velocity and the distance from us. So everybody experiences the same. And of course, there's many analogies. That was a simple one-dimensional analogy. This works in two dimensions also very well. If you imagine each galaxy is a little uh, dot, not an expanding dot. It's held together by its own gravity on the surface of a uniformly expanding rubber balloon. I like rubber for these things because it does uniformly expand if it was well manufactured to be homogeneous. And then the other classic case, which the separation over time of a bunch of randomly distributed raisins inside a baking raisin cake. Everybody's heard that definition. The raisins that start out close together after you come back an hour and the cake is doubled in size, all the dough 
that's all the space, has doubled in size in all dimensions. So the nearby raisins have doubled their distance, but if it started out nearby, it didn't recede very fast. The distant raisins, there's some distant raisins far away from you, appear to have moved away from you much faster, right? It's Hubble's law inside a raisin cake. Any uniform expansion follows this. They're not even moving. They're trying to stay you know, in space as best they can do it with the flow. They're not going anywhere, guys. It's the space between everything that has expanded uniformly. By the way, Lundmark also discovered this law uh, looking at the data too. He didn't get as much credit. What does the Hubble constant mean? It's the slope of that line, the proportionality constant. You notice that although it is a constant today in our local nearby universe, it's not guaranteed that at large distances, when the universe was considerably younger than it is now, quite a different density, and other things may have been different too, it's not guaranteed that it was expanding with the same rate that it is now, H naught, that's today, the expansion speed or uh, constant today. So I'm gonna be sophisticated and anticipate a distinct possibility that H really is not the Hubble constant, it's a constant today, it's the Hubble parameter, it's explicitly written as a function of time here. If V equals HD, then H equals what? V over D. Now let's apply this then to an object that's a distance D away or a distance R away, R and D, same thing. What's V here? It would be how much further that galaxy has gotten from us, that's the delta R, in a certain interval of time, T. Okay? This is just a rewrite of you know, Hubble's law here. But it already tells you something interesting. You'll notice that the Hubble parameter, or Hubble constant if you want, has the dimensions of, well, there's a distance in the numerator, but it also has a distance to the object, total distance in the denominator. The distance cancels out. The only thing that's left that has, it's a, it's a proportional or fractional distance per unit time. The Hubble constant then is a fractional expansion, it's a fraction, per a unit of time. The Hubble constant, the slope of that line, has the dimensions of inverse time. Or putting it the other way, the Hubble constant, the Hubble parameter, one over the Hubble parameter, has the dimensions of time, and I could call it Hubble time. Just now we're gonna do nearby only. They actually measure a Doppler shift, really, don't they? A Doppler shift, corresponds then to how much the wavelengths of light have lengthened by the time they're received at our telescopes compared to what the rest wavelengths should have been when those photons left their source. They left the stars in that other galaxy. So for nearby galaxy, it's a good approximation that this redshift, the Z is the fraction of the speed of light it's receding. You see a galaxy where systematically all of the wavelengths that you receive at your telescope are 1% longer than what we know, you know, the spectrum of a non-moving galaxy. What is the, quote, recession velocity of that galaxy? It's just 1% the speed of light, so it's, it's, it's 3,000 kilometers a second. And that would be a typical nearby galaxy receding from us. So delta T is the time the light takes to travel from the galaxy to us. So if it's not too far away, I'm just going to plug in some numbers. I said that the Hubble parameter is delta R over R. That's the fractional uh, increase in the expansion of the universe divided by delta T. Well, delta T, a D over C, so one divide by delta T, that's multiplying by C over D. We just said that this is equal to CZ. You add an R to this on one side here, plus the delta R, divide by R, C over D canceled on both sides. You're left with a definition of redshift. One plus Z is how big distance of this object is now, compared to how big it was. The one plus Z redshift factor is basically the size scale of the universe now, which is bigger, compared to what the size scale of the universe was 
when the photons left the galaxy and traveled to us at the speed of light, because they always go at the speed of light. This one plus z factor, the amount by which the universe is expanded uniformly as the light travels across that space from the galaxy to us, is exactly the amount by which the wavelength of light got stretched out. The wavelength of light got stretched out by exactly the same factor as the space itself got stretched out. This is the correct way of looking at the Hubble Doppler shift. It's the expansion of space and the photons are merely showing you the expansion that they went through. They got stretched out just like all of space does. This works generally actually for all distance of galaxies. We are gonna use this over and over again. Whenever you wanna talk about redshift, if it has to go a longer distance, it's a longer time interval, the universe has expanded more, it's a higher redshift. So this leads to a number of very important conclusions. The correct way of, of seeing the redshift factor is it tells you how much bigger all space is now compared to when those particular photons started their trip because light lengthens out and stretches the same as the space it traverses. There must be some limit to how far we can see because we cannot see anything where the recession velocity exceeds c, the speed of light, where the redshift is infinite. That doesn't mean there's nothing out past there it's just a observing horizon in an expanding universe. And it's, it happens at V equals C. Now I'm observing like hydrogen emission lines from this distant galaxy. This is what I do all the time, by the way. And they're all redshifted to a, to a longer wavelength. Oh, wait a minute, that's a lower frequency. So the photons aren't coming in at the higher frequency. They're coming in at a lower frequency. How do I measure the passage of time? You use events like the crests, uh, the alternating peaks in an electric field, for example. From our point of view in an expanding universe, everything, not just photons, everything on that galaxy appears to be slowed down. And Hubble's law says, the further away that galaxy is, the more it's slowed down. That galaxy seems to be running slow. Everything's going slow there. Of course, they're saying the same thing about us. This has actually been experimentally verified with those supernova light curves. We know, assuming that these are the same physical explosion of the white dwarf implosion of a 1A supernova, you measure the time it takes to decay at a high redshift. They've now actually discovered, measured these things at substantial redshifts. And the clock is actually slow. Those supernovas appear to be running slow.